Hafe day, everyone. Welcome to the interview, our Decision 2024 coverage. And today, we have the honor to be joined with the Democratic presidential candidate, Mr. Jason Palmer. Mr. Palmer, thank you so much for joining us. Thomas, thanks for having me. And so let's start with a bit of background on yourself. Uh, introduce yourself to the people here in the Sinemai and Guam, your background, where you're from, and, and why you're running for president. Sure. So I'm based here in Maryland, a little bit north of Washington, D.C., and I grew up in New York uh, when I was younger. And when I was younger, I always knew that government was very important to you know our society, how people do. I grew up in a democratic family where my father was an educator. He was a teacher who became a principal. And I just knew that when I eventually got to public life, I wanted to help as many people as possible. And through the years, I've actually ended up pursuing a career in entrepreneurship and impact investing, where I've founded a number of companies, often in education technology, often uh, what sometimes people call conscious capitalism companies, companies that focus on doing good for the world in some way. So not just making money, but actually improving the world in some way whether that be in climate, whether that be in education, workforce, et cetera. And in the past year, I really felt like a number of our country's greatest problems were not being addressed by the people in Washington, D.C. This probably isn't a surprise to anybody who's listening because Washington, D.C. is very dysfunctional right now. And as somebody who's 52 years old in the prime of my career, working with a lot of entrepreneurs that are improving the world on a daily basis with the work that they're doing, I asked some of my CEOs, you know, should someone like me run for president? You know, would, don't we need a business leader who understands how business and government can work together, private public partnerships? Because we do a lot of that in our work, actually. And unanimously, all of my CEOs said, yes, we need somebody to run like that. So at first, I asked around some other CEOs in my space. And then eventually, they came to me and said, Jason, it seems like this is something you could do for us. And so I'm running to try to show that there is an innovative way forward that we can start working on as a country to help everybody economically, to get to middle-class jobs, to rebuild the American dream, to be more inclusive, and that it doesn't have to be kind of us against them. It doesn't have to be this shouting match in Washington. Like we can tone down our politics, really get to solving problems. And so that's why I'm in the race to show that there's a different way forward. So I've got a chance to review a bit of your uh, bio on your campaign website. Uh, it says here, you're in executive and leadership positions. You've held these positions at multiple organizations, Microsoft, Kaplan Education, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and I, I did also want to ask you, uh, why, why uh, reach out here to the Marianas? Uh, as you are aware, uh, we don't have a vote in the popular election, uh, but we do have delegates at the convention. So. Why was it important for you to um, reach out to us here in the cinema in Guam? Yeah, it was important for me to reach out to you because climate change is a major issue that I'm focused on. And then I'm not sure enough politicians in Washington are focused on. And I know that affects you in, you know, in larger typhoon seasons, you know, the increase in the temperature, the increase in the sea levels. And so it was really important to me to reach out to, and we're gonna be on the ballots in Hawaii, Guam, Northern Marianas. I'm speaking with some folks from American Samoa next week. Um, and I do think that, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the continental United States does not pay enough attention to our Pacific commonwealths and states. And, you know, I wanna make sure that if I'm a big believer in inclusion, that I actually practice it and how I conduct this campaign. And you are running under the Democratic banner. Uh, President Biden is the incumbent and the presumptive nominee. Uh, some might say, uh, you know, it's a hard battle to fight. So why decide to throw your hat in the race that might, to some people, already be predetermined? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And that was the first question that the people from Politico and the BBC News asked me as well. And I know, you know, running against an incumbent president, and I actually voted for Joe Biden four years ago. And I actually think he's done a fairly good job as president. Uh, but there's just not that sense of urgency. There's not the get things done attitude that maybe that's related to his age. Maybe that's related to he just doesn't come from the private sector and have kind of, we need to get things done. We need to push through bureaucracy mentality. You know, he's had 50 years of great public service, but I think he's been captured by the bureaucracy as opposed to someone from, from the outside who can actually change things. And I think it's super important that we send the message to Washington, you know, more and more every week I'm hearing about how Washington is dysfunctional, there needs to be an outsider who comes in to change, but it doesn't need to be an outsider like Donald Trump, who's actually going to make everyone hate each other more. There's an alternative approach. You know, I'm a person who believes we can work across party lines, we can be collaborative, we can actually solve our problems together. And, uh, you know, I want to be the change that I think our country needs. So what is your what does your campaign road look like ahead? What is your strategy to garner enough votes to possibly be, um, you know, a real contender to, uh, against Biden? Thank you. So I do realize I'm a long shot, uh, but my life as a venture capitalist and impact investor is to invest in long shots. And in order to win as a long shot, you have to have kind of a guerrilla marketing strategy, so to speak. And you know, even speaking with you is a little bit of my guerrilla marketing strategy. I don't believe any other campaigns have reached out to uh, Northern Marianas or American Samoa or Hawaii or even Guam, even though these are larger territories even than yourself. And I think that by focusing on places that are underappreciated and overlooked and actually understanding your needs and responding to your needs, that's one part of the strategy. I'll tell you a little bit more that I've also in the last couple of weeks released a commercial related to my expertise in artificial intelligence. Everybody's concerned about is AI going to take away jobs? How is AI going to change our society? And I'll be releasing more things related to AI in the coming weeks to show how AI can actually improve our society if it's harnessed properly. And so I have things in my positions on my website. If you look on the website, there are 25 policy positions. And one of them is that we need a new department of innovation and technology. The reason why we're so slow to respond to climate change or artificial intelligence or nanotechnology, biotechnology, we're not being as innovative as we used to, is we don't actually have a government department at the cabinet level where we're actually focused on solving these problems, building the right regulations, making sure we invest in the right technologies. And so I will be proposing that and have already proposed that uh, these are the types of things that will set me apart and help bring me up more and more in the rankings and more and more in the visibility as the campaign goes on. So here in the Pacific, uh, we're, uh, we are uh, near Asia and the Indo-Pacific region is uh, a large focus uh, of every administration. Um, there's conflicts around the world and there is also a growing concern about uh, the rising tensions with China. So what, what's your approach there with regards to the Indo-Pacific strategy? I'm sure many of our audience would be curious to hear that the commander, in, uh, possibly the next commander in chief, what your strategy might be. Absolutely. So I put myself in the category as a leader where I actually think America should be focused on not being the world's policeman, but actually encouraging more democracy, encouraging more human rights around the world, using more soft power. Uh, we become too, I would even say, addicted to hard power of getting involved in every military conflict around the world. And we're not smart enough about using our soft power. In China's case, we do need to contain China to prevent their expansion in the South China Sea, for example. I agree with the Biden administration on the changes they've made to prevent technology 
technologies that could be advanced technologies like AI from getting in the hands of China. But we don't want to be sort of beating the war drums and creating a new Cold War with China. We need to set up the right coopetition relationship with China. They are more than you know, 1.3 billion people. They want to be recognized as a global superpower. And there are ways to you know, help them feel more respected as a superpower while at the same time keeping them contained so they don't keep expanding their territory. They do have expansionist uh, desires, uh, but also so did the United States uh, back in the 1800s and 1900s when we expanded coast to coast, when we expanded even all the way to the Northern Marianas Islands. And if we actually provide the right level of freedom, human rights, democracy, et cetera, and we encourage them that if they bring those types of things to the territories that they already control, like Hong Kong, needs to go back to a more democratic style of rule. It needs to be more human rights there. Then we will accept them as a superpower. But right now, this beating the war drums and trying to create another Cold War with China, that's not good. That's not good for America, and that's not good for Northern Marianas Islands either. I realize on your uh, campaign website, you have a question here. How can someone with no government experience expect to succeed? Every year, every election cycle, we hear about the desire for outsiders to come in. Uh, would you consider yourself an outsider? And how do you think that will uh, play out in this race? I am an outsider. Um, and partly that question is on the website because it does come up all the time. But I'm sort of government adjacent is the way I like to think of it because I did work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for a number of years, and I helped uh, enact policies that helped improve the number of students who got into college and graduate from college. I was on the board of the Smithsonian uh, related to conservation biology around the world. And that's a very important, uh, actually, it is part of the federal government. It's its own independent organization that's part of the federal government. And I worked for Senator Moynihan, who was a senator from New York way back when I was in college. So I understand how government works. And I also understand uh, from a lot of friends of mine who might end up becoming people in my administration, what makes it not work. Uh, but it is important to come from the outside and have kind of a business person's mentality about like, for example, we've run a budget deficit for 22 of the last 23 years. If a company lost money for two years in a row, the CEO would be out, let alone 22 years in a row. And so we need to get our budget into balance. We need to be focused more on spending money on things that work and measuring the ROI of those things that actually work. Um, and we need to make sure we're focused on the outputs, like what is the actual impact of these programs? Right now, a lot of money is just being spent with no accountability, with no reporting as to does it actually work. Um, so I guess the best way to say it is I do have enough government experience to know how government works. I will, well, I'm not someone like Trump who's going to come in there and not even know the various departments or to where we can move faster, we can get things done. We don't need to move at a bureaucracy pace. All right, Mr. Palmer, those are all the questions I had. I just wanted to open the floor for you to address the constituents here in the Marianas. I believe uh, the Democratic Party, at least, is preparing to decide its delegates and hold its uh, primary. So what, what's your message to them as they organize here? Yeah, my main message to you would be if climate change is an important issue to you, if your own uh, you know, connection to the mainland is something where you want representation, not just to have non-voting representation, but to actually have your voice heard. I'm one, someone who understands you and who cares about what's happening in the Pacific. And what's happening in the Pacific is two things importantly, climate change, which I put at the center of my agenda. And then secondly, actually helping to lift people up economically. So we didn't get to talk about that there is this concept of new collar jobs. They're sort of the blue collar jobs of this area of this era. If you have technological skills, 
then you can work from anywhere in the world and actually get yourself plugged into the global economy and make between $50,000 a year and $200,000 a year. And it's something where I want to help you all to actually access those technological companies because you have a special status as an American Commonwealth. And therefore you can actually generate a lot more money for the islands that can actually grow the economy there, result in more hospitals, result in more schools, provide more wealth to everyone on the islands. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Palmer. Appreciate your time. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you.